Welcome to the podcast. Uh, a couple of epigraphs here to start us off from the Bible. Old Testament first, book of Genesis, chapter 3 says, In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. That's the punishment Adam gets for disobeying God. And in the New Testament, Paul says, uh, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. When I was in my early 20s studying literature with a bunch of utopian progressives, uh, <clears throat> it seemed kind of laughable to me, at the time at least, that many of them were still reading Karl Marx as if Marxism could still be relevant. This was like 2001, 2002. After all, the Soviet Union had collapsed just 10 years earlier. How could they have failed to learn the lesson? I remember I even went so far as to have a Marx is dead t-shirt printed. I guess it was like a satire of the God is dead maxim I had heard attributed to Nietzsche at the time. And I wore the shirt to a gra graduate seminar one time. It wasn't much of a hit. I mean, it kind of just perplexed everybody there. But the like the, these students that I was with, seem, they seemed unflappable in their Marxism. They continued reading Marx, they persisted in that direction, and so finally I decided, okay, I gotta read this stuff. I read the Communist Manifesto, I read Das Kapital volumes one and two at least, I think I quit on the third one, but, and I read some of, you know, Marx and Engels' essays, and then I read some Lenin, and <clears throat> whatever, a bunch of stuff like that, and, and so on. But then I thought, well, okay, I mean, who is it that best argued against all of this stuff? Um, surely someone saw that it wouldn't work as well as, you know, Marx had hoped. So that was what sort of set me off doing some of the reading that followed, which was when I was, you know, and this was when I was like 24 years old, I started reading basically Austrian school economics um, over in the, like, business library, von Mises and Hayek. Joseph Schumpeter, Karl Menger, Eugen Baumbach, and so on. I suspect I'm one of like four living PhDs in literature to have also read, you know, von Mises' Human Action cover to cover and liked it. <laughs> the point is, I was a 20 something capitalist, okay? That's how this story begins. But then I read Herman Melville's Bartleby the Scrivener for the second or third time, and it started to click for me. And it may have helped that it was also, at the time, I was reading some uh, obscure literary criticism infused with, you know, Marxist critiques of capitalism, or I was reading Stephen Crane's stories that were sort of critiques about the Gilded Age or Theodore Dreiser, you know, the class on naturalism and so on at the time, stuff like that. In this video, we're going to talk mostly about Bartleby, but before I get to it, I want to mention those epigraphs again. Both the Old Testament right at the start in Genesis and the New Testament affirm that men should work, and by their sweat they should make a living. And so it's a commandment given by God. But to really get to the core of what this means, you have to learn quite a lot about what work meant, you know, 2,000 years ago and what it meant for Thomas Aquinas, and what it meant for the Puritans. Y you need to like read some Max Weber and Thorsten Veblen. And then if you're, you know, like, if you're reading a book of theory called, for example, like this is one of the ones I read, American Romanticism and the Marketplace, about how impossible it was for good writers like Herman Melville and Nathaniel Hawthorne to make money on their work, while mobs of scribbling women were rattling off bestsellers because the reading public had crappy taste, if you get to reading this stuff, the picture starts to come into focus in a new sort of way. And add to this a skim read or a Wikipedia page read of David Graeber's 2018 book, Bullshit Jobs. Here's the title, at least. And maybe even read the first page of my own dad's dissertation. I think it was 1971 or so. My own dad's dissertation called The Concept of Play in American Physical Education. 
And uh, I just love this first paragraph. I've always kind of laughed at it from the first time I read it. He First of all, epigraphs from Schiller and Hegel and Nietzsche. And then it says, <clears throat> Leisure and its attendant implications for a meaningful play life have been extended widely in recent years. Modern life is beginning to revolution... Is is being revolutionized by the extension and general acceptance of the leisure concept. People have always had some leisure, but in recent years it has come in excess with such suddenness that few are aware of its far-reaching significance. Although there are still sections of the world in which leisure is not universally enjoyed, The American citizen has never before enjoyed a period of history during which the opportunities for leisure have been so numerous. I mean, this cracks me up because I don't feel like we have all the leisure. It's like, you know, he has this Jetsons view that, like, everyone's just going to be loafing around in the near future. Anyway, what's being negotiated here is what work ought to mean and how it ought to be compensated or rewarded. And I don't want to make the mistake of being an outright utopian like Fourier or something. The oceans aren't going to turn to lemonade, and we won't all be millionaires. But it is a very modern, and actually a novel argument, to make the case that St. Paul was thinking of Christians doing data entry jobs in cubicles when he said, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. So I think we can think about what kind of work is given to mankind. So think for a minute about Bartleby's job. And for the record, in this video, I'm basically taking it for granted that you've read the story more or less. And if you haven't, I mean, go read the Wikipedia page to like it'll. It's it's a classic American story, if nothing else. And the one sentence summary of Bartleby the Scrivener by Melville is that it is the story of a guy who gets hired at a law office to do copying. And then, after a day or two, starts saying, as a refrain, I would prefer not to. I would prefer not to. About pretty much everything that his boss asks him to do. And his boss is this eccentric guy who kind of cares about his employees. And so, it just goes on and on and gets more and more absurd uh, until the end. I won't sort of spoil the end in case you were going to read it. But, okay. What was his job? What was Bartleby's job? This was 1853. He was a copyist, a copyist at a law office. The job is something that does not require or value humanness at all. This job can be done, and in fact is now done in the 21st century, by a Xerox machine, right? So a 19th century copyist's job is merely to copy, like, the you know he just the stuff over here on his left with his right hand all day and that's all he does his job is to come to work and give nothing of himself or his personality indeed the less he brings of that of self with all of its complicated emotions and desires and impulses the better as far as the business is concerned and the same thing of course was true of factory jobs and the same thing is now largely true of these data entry jobs and so many other jobs not all jobs but many and the next thing that's interesting about this story is that its setting is wall street yes even in 1853 wall street was the symbol of financial capitalism which is sort of the definition of well what i've called mammonism sometimes what is mammonism? Look, mammonism, if you're, if you're merely a Ludwig von Mises, capitalist, libertarian, uh, you know, free market, laissez-faire person, I guess you can just deny that that's a thing. But if you're a, if, if you're a God believer at all, if New Testament, Old Testament stuff means anything, mammonism is a real thing, and it definitely does associate with, like, like money worship. Okay, let me take a sip of my first iced coffee of the season. So we'll kind of vaguely define it as, um, you know, the love of money as an end in itself here. That's mammonism. It is worship of money. That is not, according to either the Old or the New Testament, the proper way for people to live. 
Your work should be to serve God, which of course can mean to serve other people and can mean to get paid. But I think, like, uh, like it should involve an opportunity to give something of yourself, I guess I would say, in the course of your work. And so if you have the kind of job that doesn't let you show your stuff or where you feel like merely a replaceable part, merely a cog in the machine, then the only motivation you have for doing that work would seem to be money. And we can do better than that, gang. That's what I'm saying. Remember this clip from my episode on Henry David Thoreau? Quote, I would fain say something, not so much concerning the Chinese and Sandwich Islanders, as you who read these pages, who are said to live in New England, something about your condition, especially your outward condition or circumstances in this world, in this town, what it is, whether it is necessary that it be as bad as it is, whether it cannot be improved as well as not. So he starts out by saying, I'm not here to write, you know, an Edward Said book about the other side of the world or, or about really humankind either. Really, I'm, I'm focused on you people in Concord and your life in 1848 or 1852 or whenever you publish this. He says, continuing, I have traveled a good deal in Concord and everywhere, in shops and offices and fields. The inhabitants have appeared to me to be doing penance in a thousand remarkable ways. Penance, of course, is, you know, like from the Catholic tradition where you have to do essentially like, you know, make up praying or whatever after the sin, after the confession. And, and sometimes, of course, in the Middle Ages, it took the form of things like, you know, uh, self-flagellation and wearing the silice, the hair shirt thing, and so on. So he's saying, I look around Concord, and it seems that people are making themselves extremely uncomfortable as if they're doing penance. He continues, quote, what I have heard of Brahmins sitting exposed to four fires and looking in the face of the sun, you got to picture that, or hanging suspended, quote, until it becomes impossible for them to resume their natural position, while from the twist of the neck, nothing but liquids can pass into their stomach. So they would take these crazy yoga poses, you know, with their heads turned around and never undo them. Or, continuing, or dwelling, chained for life at the foot of a tree, or measuring with their bodies like caterpillars the breadth of vast empires, or standing on one leg on the tops of pillars. Even these forms of conscious penance are hardly more incredible and astonishing than the scenes which I daily witness in Concord. So my motivation for doing this video is to respond to some of the more annoying comments that I got after my appearance, my sort of laid-back, bad camera appearance on Otto's show recently. You know, the comments that were like, wow, what an entitled prick this guy is. The Alex DeLarge sort of comment, I guess. First, I mean, yeah, okay, yeah, I let my guard down on that show and kind of went casual and spoke in a very personal way which made it sound as if my thinking was primarily about me rather than about work and capitalism in general. Like, I get it, kind of, but also it's a part of the reason that YouTube sucks is like people want it to be about the person when that's not what I'm doing. Like, I'm thinking about, think, you know, abstractly about work as a concept or about like, American industry in the 21st century in general. My my aim in that appearance was just to point out that, like my for example, talking about myself now, my own vocation is clearly teaching. And I would like to teach, and I think I'm pretty good at it. But the profession is currently requiring people like me and Otto, apparently, to make compromises that feel like a bit much. You know what I mean? And so, like, this critique that, like, oh, you're a loser because you're not willing to compromise or something, that's a, re that's a strange take for, like, you know, a, a, like, I don't know, sort of like a right wing or a dissident or a, or really, it's, a, it's not even a right wing, it's more of a left wing, I guess, critique here. But, like, anyone who sees what's going on where you're supposed to, like, be, you know, you have to go to the, the diversity training seminars all the time, even though you think that's bullshit. Well, like, that means that your average, total libtard, you know, wacky, progressive, Marxist English professor is a winner, whereas me trying to hold the line on sort of basic, regular reality principles is a loser. And it's like, I get that from the mammon perspective. I don't get it from the perspective of like this little weird circle of the internet where we're trying to make things a little better and figure out what should be, you know, sort of the new the new norm or a better norm or whatever. But beyond that, beyond that stuff about me, my more general point was that I think we ought to all be better compensated. 
and given more freedom than we are currently given in the marketplace. And frankly, it's getting to a point where if you're just holding the laissez-faire position and pretending you can't see that these hyper-modern jobs aren't leading to general human thriving, like if you can't acknowledge that, like that, after I've cited, you know, Graeber and Henry David Thoreau and Melville and Karl Marx and a couple stories from the Globe and Mail, just because those ones, those sources all recently sprang to mind while I was writing this, but I could easily produce a dozen more good sources on the same topics. And if after all that, you're still like, oh, I don't see the problem, just go get a job. You know what I mean? I think then at that point, you're either you're the one immersed in privilege because you have a job where you feel that you are expressing yourself and getting pl like paid plenty with plenty of vacation time and so on. That could be the case for some of you. Or else you're like either being naive, willfully, or you've like you've got Stockholm syndrome and you've internalized the crazy logic of accelerated capitalism because I guess probably you felt so beaten by it that you had no choice but to sort of embrace it or something. So, you know, that's, I think your chances are most of you are just being naive about the conditions of many millions of actual Americans, not to mention the people on the low end of the global capitalist totem or a share poll or whatever it is, right? Anyway, when I used to teach Bartleby in a classroom with college students, the, the question eventually always came up, what does an employer owe to his employees? Is it merely the minimum wage or, you know, whatever the baseline salary is to procure the services of an employee? In general, that's the line my students would take. They would say, well, look, the boss pays a certain sum of cash, and then you, his employee, have to adjust yourself to his every whim throughout the day, and work, by the way, without any long-term promise of continuing employment forever. You know, so, like, for example, look at how Bartleby started in the office. And it's the, it's the boss who narrates Bartleby's story. So this quote is the boss speaking. He says, I should have stated before that ground glass folding doors divided my premises into two parts, one of which was occupied by my scriveners, the other by myself. According to my humor, I threw open these doors or closed them. I resolved to assign Bartleby a corner by the folding doors, but on my side of them, so as to have this quiet man within easy call, in case any trifling thing was to be done. I placed his desk close up to a small side window in that part of the room, a window which originally had afforded a lateral view of, a certain, grimy, uh, of certain grimy backyards and bricks, but which owing to subsequent erections commanded at present no view at all, though it gave some light. Within three feet of the panes was a wall, and the light came down from far above, between two lofty buildings, as from a very small opening in a dome. Still further to a satisfactory arrangement, I procured a high green folding screen, which might entirely isolate Bartleby from my sight, though not remove him from my voice, and thus in a manner privacy and society were conjoined. Well, you notice that like it's according to the boss's whim all day long, whether or not the doors are open and whether he calls Bartleby and so on. Bartleby's whims, like technically, according to this kind of rationalist American capitalism, never matter, right? The employee's whims don't count. So, like I said, in this exchange, the boss gets everything his way, and Bartleby really can only comply. Should a view of a brick wall three feet away not, like, please Bartleby, he, the, according to the apologists of capitalism, he is at most free to resign, given that he gives the boss a two weeks' notice, presumably, and go find a job with, you know, better positioning. Now, <clears throat> another question I used to pose to students Think about human traits as falling along a bell curve. For instance, when it comes to preferences for how much we sleep per night, the average is probably around seven and a half hours. But surely there are some people who prefer only six hours of sleep a night, and that means some on the other end of the bell curve who prefer as many as nine hours per night. Humans are all wired a little differently, right? 
But now consider the question of how many hours of uh, work a human prefers to do each week. And let's even stipulate that the average number is 40, which I think is questionable. But okay, that means some people out there will be, you know, on the right edge, wanting to do as many as maybe 60 hours per week. We call these workaholics sometimes, but they generally don't have any problem with, like, capitalism, right? If anything, they'll get paid overtime or, I don't know, whatever. I mean, these people just love working. But that implies that at the other end of the bell curve, there are people who would prefer to work no more than 20 hours a week. And in capitalism, those people will be valued far, far less. Generally, in our system, they'll be unable even to acquire a benefits package. But having a preference for 20 hours of work a week is really no different than preferring to eat four meals a day or one meal per day. It's one of these hardwired things. And why? Why should we be ranking people according to this measure? Now, look, of course, I mean, I'm sort of dialing up the contrast here for effect. And this story is a fiction. It's a kind of a parable. Under normal circumstances, Bartleby would simply have been fired for insubordination, right? But the story is an early critique of, like, office, white-collar capitalism. And I still think it hits the target. The other curious thing about Bartleby is that he doesn't seem to have many desires. And desire, or like dreams, as the capitalist will sell them to you, selling your own dreams back to you, so to speak, is sort of like the fuel that powers the whole like operation, right? So like, you know, like uh, want to travel or build a new deck or buy a fancy bike, or eat organic food, or have a big flat screen TV or whatever, well, you gotta work, bucko, you know? But what about the occasional person who is generally content with the very meager living quarters, you know, minimal fancy food, and, you know, consider this, who will just throw on the literal same clothes each day over and over again at work? I mean, there's no law against it, right? But... Like, will he even be permitted to get away with it? That's so eccentric and strange, right? I mean, and again, like, I know that some of you out there might say, what kind of a loser just wears the same clothes every day? But that's because you haven't read the Sermon on the Mount carefully enough, apparently. That's because you have internalized this capitalist sort of desire, always for you know, new clothes, wanting to try new restaurants, stay at fancy resorts, buy labels on bottles of wine and so on. But, you know, should a man come along with no particular taste for these things, basically on the cusp of being an enlightened Buddha, then the allure of making money really becomes less motivating, right? I mean, he has basically stepped off the treadmill and the machinery doesn't really know what to make of him. The story says Bartleby lived on ginger nuts and actually slept at the office. Ginger nuts are just, you know, some little cookie cracker thing, right? And there's one other critique of my critique that you sometimes hear, especially from women, and that is, you're just acting like an arrested development man-child. And it's tempting to, like, just kind of go with that and defend it on the basis of, like, again, Jesus. Like, only if you become as little children can you enter the kingdom of heaven. And on that basis, you might defend this sort of a thing. But I actually think there's a more salient point to make about that. The most like a man I ever felt, uh, or like, yeah, the most like a man I ever felt that I was allowed to feel was probably like sophomore year in college while I was still on the baseball team. After that, when I decided to turn to studying stuff seriously in preparation to go to grad school, in preparation to get a job, there were certain features of my personality that felt very manly that I had to begin suppressing. And this is like, this whole process only intensified when I went on the job market and eventually you know, when I worked at a university for 13 years. Where, like, where did the belly laughing go? Where, you know, where had the long, like, the sort of 
the like storytelling, the loud talking, the crass jokes, the high fives, even the butt slapping. Where did all that go? When I was in high school, my best friend would invite me, for example, this is just an example that came to mind, like up, up to his cabin for the weekend. And I always knew that that meant working all day on Saturday, usually with like a tobacco dip in our lip, before we could go jet skiing and play all day on Sunday, fishing, whatever. And what was the working? Well, it was like random stuff his dad would have us do. His dad would like give us two axes and be like, go chop down all the trees that are smaller than your thigh out back or whatever. And I like, you might anticipate where I'm going with all this and say, oh, well, hey, there's nothing preventing you from working a blue collar job. Well, sort of, but why is it that that kind of job and that the manliness that goes with it like, why is that only allowed in those blue-collar jobs? While, of course, note, blue-collar jobs are low status and receive less pay. Why is that? Why do all the incentives encourage the suppression of manliness in offices, dealing with paperwork and signatures and telephone calls and so many sort of, you know, androgynous functions, right? What I'm asking is, why is it that one of the features of capitalism is that, like, jackhammering asphalt on a highway all day pays like $17 an hour while being an accountant or data entry guy pays $49,000 a year. When, and shut up, shut up, because if you're in there going like, oh, it's demand or something, no, come on. It, like, the, the reality is that far fewer people can do the jackhammer on the highway job all year than can do the data entry accountant job, right, easily. These are, these are the mystery initiation rites in our economy, I guess. But what's really strange to me about all of this is how it even needs to be explained. Like, have none of you read Leo Marx's 1964 book, The Machine in the Garden? In the winter of uh, 1782 and 3, he sat down, he was in one of his periods of retreat from the world of politics. And he sat down uh, to answer a series of questions submitted to him by uh, a French diplomat. And he arranged the questions in what he thought was a sensible order and ended up writing his, own, his only book called Notes on Virginia. One of the questions was, should the United States develop manufactures? And Jefferson's answer was an unequivocal no. His exploration of the American pastoral ideal are you totally ignorant of Wendell Berry? The thing that we are having trouble confronting, and both sides are having trouble to confront it publicly and speak of it, is the disaster of being governed by the corporations, those fictitious persons. And, um, uh, you know, you're waiting for the day when some politician of stature and visibility will finally say, we can't have this any longer. We're here in Washington or Frankfurt to represent the people not to be employed or bought by the corporations. With the these sorts of thinkers, like I'm the one articulating a traditional attitude toward the economy. It's feudal or pre-modern. It's the apprentice and master. It's bucolic, etc. This Milton Friedman thing, this, this new ideal where everything is about manipulating capital and where laborers all have to subordinate to their bosses, like... This is actually sort of stunning that this view has not only become the norm, but like it's become so pervasive that for someone like me to even allude to the view that was normal before 1955 is now considered almost psychotic. Imagine, like I imagine people like some of these, like some of the people who don't know what I'm talking about with the kind of this like kind of romantic, uh, like pre-capitalist ideal for an economy. I imagine them just like watching Blade Runner or The Matrix and not even seeing it as dystopian, but just thinking like, yeah, this is a typical city. And some apparently think of it as an ideal. It's crazy. Quoting Leo Marx from that 1964 book, no single motive can affect, uh, sorry, no, he's talking, he's talking about these, these, um, like, th these impulses Americans have to like go back to nature or stay 
bucolic in some in some ways, even if only symbolically. And he says, no single motive can account for these disparate phenomena, yet each does express something of the yearning for a simpler, more harmonious style of life, an existence closer to nature, that is the psych the, that is the psychotic psychotic, the psychic root of all pastoralism, genuine and spurious. That such desires are not peculiar to Americans goes without saying. But our experience as a nation unquestionably has invested them with peculiar intensity. The soft veil of nostalgia that hangs over our urbanized landscape is largely a vestige of the once dominant image of an undefiled green republic, a quiet land of forests, villages, and farms dedicated to the pursuit of happiness. End quote. To try to pathologize a preference against hyper-modern, hyper-urban office, quote-unquote, labor, even seems un-American to me. Or, if you'll allow me to add a little more pathos here to make the point even clearer, here's a paragraph from an 1864 short story by Rebecca Harding Davis called Life in the Iron Mills that suggests it isn't only the fake electric lights and emasculation of indoor office spaces that gives work its degrading aspect. Actually, before I read that quote from the Rebecca Harding Davis story, here's let me show you an image of here uh, a single sentence I can remember from von Mises's Human Action, where he talks about how work. Let me let me put this into my notes so I don't forget this. Uh, work is a disutility, and it's like, what does that mean? That means that it's natural for people to not want to work. The only thing that keeps people working is incentives that they find to be more valuable than they're not wanting to work. So if you find people who are like, yeah, I don't, it's not appealing to me, I don't even want this job or something, like then the job needs to start paying more. You know, now, or, of course, or you can just import a bunch of extremely desperate immigrants who will do those jobs and say, oh, Americans don't want to get their hands dirty anymore. It's like, well, okay, kind of. But like, if I have to compete with the most desperate person who you've brought here from, you know, the Congo or something, it's like, yeah, you, that's, that's a pretty crappy deal we're, we're sort of coming up against now. Here's what Rebecca Harding Davis says. She's telling the story of a man named Wolf who is worn down to the nub by his job in a, an iron working factory, right? Quote, I want you to come down and look at this wolf, standing there among the lowest of his kind, and see him just as he is, that you may judge him justly when you hear the story of this night. I want you to look back, as he does every day, at his birth in vice, his starved infancy, to remember the heavy years he has groped through as boy and man, the slow, heavy years of constant, hot work, so long ago he began, that he thinks sometimes he has worked there for ages. There is no hope that it will ever end. Think that God put into this man's soul a fierce thirst for beauty, to know it, to create it, to be Something, he knows not what, other than he is. There are moments when a passing cloud, the sun glinting on the purple thistles, a kindly smile, a child's face, will rouse him to a passion of pain, when his nature starts up with a mad cry of rage against God, man, whoever it is that has forced this vile, slimy life upon him. With all this groping, this mad desire, a great blind intellect stumbling through wrong, a loving poet's heart, the man was by habit only a coarse, vulgar laborer, familiar with sights and words you would blush to name. Be just, 
When I tell you about this night, see him as he is. Be just, not like man's law, which seizes on one isolated fact, but like God's judging angel, whose clear, sad eye saw all the countless cankering days of this man's life, all the countless nights, when, sick with starving, his soul fainted in him before it judged him for this night the saddest of all. End quote. At some level, I mean, this is probably a good example of a question that it's difficult to handle with pure reason. I've been thinking about this over the last couple of videos with like the thing about pure reason and Dionysianism and stuff, and I thought Arvold's response was great about how when you have people with different views of things, the only way to reach an agreement seems to be reason. Yes. But to reason through the problem of the disutility of work, you can do it wrong. You can end up sounding like von Mises. It's all about numbers there, supply and demand, where one of the commodities is labor, as if labor is, you know, sort of not human beings, right? And as if it doesn't involve emotion and preference and God-given desire for beauty and dignity and leisure and so on. But when we reason, we have to keep in mind that we are reasoning about so many individual humans. A strictly logical capitalism needed nothing from Bartleby except for him to act part like a Xerox machine, basically, right? But there are limits to the kinds and quantities of alienation a man can endure. You ever see any of these 20th century paintings about alienation? I mean, you ever read like Gregor Samsa was a traveling salesman? What do you think that story is about? Like, why? what's so bad about Gregor Samsa's job that he turns into a bug? That whole story is about feeling alienated by modern capitalism because he's a replaceable part in a system that doesn't value his humanness, right? Look, if you have a job where you feel you feel needed beyond your mere technical competency, where your personality is involved, where you're encouraged to be you at work, and that's not just a slogan, well, then you're lucky and good. Godspeed, you know what I mean? Most bosses feel no obligation to their employees, and in fact would rather have robots than human employees. And my hunch is that after years facing such a situation, many people sort of just become the robot. And you know, a robot always says he likes his job, and a robot kind of goes on the defensive when you tell him capitalism could be better. A robot ends up defending his boss even though the boss literally makes profit by simply paying the robot less and keeping some of the profit for himself. It's amazing, isn't it? Anyway, it's just something to think about. Like I said, I mean, this is not my view. This is the, this is a com this is the common critique of very modern, by the way, modern post-French Revolution capitalism, which is a new thing in history. And this is the chief line of critique of it that I'm trying to articulate here. Uh, but that's pretty much all I've got for this video. The next one I'm going to do will be something totally different. Um, back to, actually a little bit back to the idea of thinking about like reason again. Um, the story I want to deal with, it's fiction though. It's one of Borges' short stories called Funes el Memorioso. Or as I call it in English, Funes his memory. So we'll do that one in the next episode. I've already got the thumbnail ready and stuff. So uh, thanks for listening. Talk to you next time. This has been the Godward podcast. Bye-bye.